Cheers, guys. Epics 911, welcome to the Saturday, August 26th, 2017 edition of VR News. Let's dive right into VR News, guys, starting with this first story, which is confirmation from KFC that their training program is an actual training program and not some type of viral marketing campaign. Spokesperson from Yum Brands, they're the corporation that owns KFC and Taco Bell. They responded with the following press release. KFC will use the VR simulation to supplement its robust multi-step employment training program called Chicken Mastery Certification, which provides detailed e-learning and hands-on training for cooks in each of KFC's kitchens. KFC will provide yet another platform for training by bringing the VR simulation technology to its regional general manager training classes, quarterly franchise meetings, and employee onboarding. That same spokesperson also saying that the actual act of prepping the original recipe chicken takes about 25 minutes. Within the VR training simulation, it's about 10 minutes. This next story, Road to VR, they've got an interesting set of statistics from Google's own listed employment opportunities. Here's that graph, and it shows the number of Google augmented and virtual reality job listings posted for just this year. You can see there's a clear trend, the volume growing in each individual quarter, and that pretty much would fit how a lot of companies plan for projects from one quarter to the next within a given fiscal year. Based on these numbers, they should be adding about 73 new job listings over the course of the year. And that brings us to this story involving NASA, definitely one of my favorite topics and organizations. Thomas Grubb, an engineer at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center, he's leading a team to develop six different multidisciplinary pilot projects that highlight the potential for virtual reality and augmented reality that NASA could themselves use in the future. Grubb saying in a statement, anyone who followed the popularity of Pokemon Go last year has seen how the public has embraced this technology. Just as it's changing the gaming industry, it is gonna change the way we do our jobs. Five years from now, it's gonna be amazing. Now, for budget-strapped NASA, virtual reality and augmented could mean reducing time and money spent finding issues, fixing those issues. They're working together with the University of Maryland, College Park, and Bowie State University to create those future apps. So Grubb was asked what he felt one of the major features of VR was for them. He responded, the collaborative capability is a major feature in VR, even though they may work at locations hundreds of miles apart, engineers could work together to build and evaluate designs in real time due to the shared VR environment. Now, some of those six applications, they've got one where engineers can assemble and interact with various spaceship parts. Additional ones of those six, you can check those all out via the link to the article, which I've got in the description below. And a topic we have talked about from time to time, VR treadmills mentioned that there's a couple of you guys that have one of these now, not this specific brand, but you've got a VR treadmill. Well, Dutch reseller Virtual VR, they are a Western retailer for the Chinese manufacturer of the catwalk treadmill. They were at Gamescom in Germany and Road to VR was able to do some hands-on testing. Now these things are massive and they are expensive to ship due to that. So we just haven't been seeing a lot of these in the West. Even in the larger VR arcades, they're essentially pretty much non-existent elsewhere in the world. So he describes the whole process. Just gonna sum it up in the sense that he didn't like the main feature, which was the walking feature. He felt it was kind of like taking baby steps forward, backward, Given more time, he does acknowledge it would probably become more comfortable, but that mixed in with the fact that you couldn't strafe 
kind of seems to limit the potential for a device that big. You would think stuff like strafing would be part of the makeup of that device and part of the cell, not the case. Now, he did state that the shoes he used, the slip-on booties, not what you would actually use with the device. So some of the complaints he, again, acknowledges probably due to exactly that, not having the right shoes on. Lifting himself into the unit, a pain in the butt, and let's face it, and uh, I love you, bro, but seeing Exidy lift himself into one of these, or hell, seeing myself lift myself into one of these, that just might not end too well. He talks about that process in a lot of detail, and basically then goes on to describe the low-budget version of a Counter-Strike style game that he played, using the Vive headset attached to the unit. Hearing this, guys, more convinced than I've probably ever been that these are not going to be a peripheral solution for virtual reality. I don't see them working in the short term, and I don't see them working in the long term. Now, I've said that before, but I got to admit, I feel even stronger about that today. It's just too limiting and too frickin' massive. That's the bottom line. And when I speak to people who don't have a VR unit, but I know them to be gamers, hardcore gamers, a lot of them, one of the most common complaints isn't the price, and I've touched on this before too, it's the bulk. Having stuff on your body, covering your head or you know, slipping on a jacket type device, or like this one, basically doing a pull-up to get yourself into the damn device. Not a lot of people in favor of that or want to even have to put up with that. So I just think we're going to continue to see growth just slowly trend upwards eventually as the price reduces, which I know is a bit of a catch-22, and more importantly, the technology gets smaller and less bulky. And with something like this, I think they're going to be able to accomplish the same thing using body tracking and software at the end of the day. And that's probably going to be their death knell. Let me know what you guys think in the comments below. Well, one thing is pretty clear on this channel and other VR channels. When the topic of VR locomotion comes up, it's inevitably tethered to VR motion sickness. That always becomes part of the discussion. It is the main reason, other than like I pointed out the other day, game mechanics, that teleportation is still even a thing. The good news is that there are companies, even while I'm yapping right now, working on solutions. Some of it is software-based, some of it is hardware-based. One of those, like this one, a software-based solution. This is VR Remedy. Well, and they talk about what most of us know already, and that is what causes this, that it's the disconnect between your eyes, your inner ear, and that is something taken extremely seriously by a lot of these companies. One of the obvious reasons it's taken so serious isn't necessarily out of care for people's health, but more in an economic sense. Reduce VR motion sickness and logically you can increase your customer base. Not all companies or individuals are driven by this. For some, possibly it's altruistic reasons. And part of that is the gender divide when it comes to motion sickness. The severity of the symptoms are essentially equal between men and women. Statistically though, women are far more likely to have it in the first place. Controlled studies showing 30% of men getting motion sickness, 70% of women. And the last time I touched on that was when I did the VR arcade in Halifax interview. But I mention it because it's on topic here. That is obviously a huge percentage of potential customers. So those are the reasons and companies like VR Remedy hoping to find the solutions. These guys are based in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and they're working on a system of adjusting or dialing in the setting that's most comfortable for someone who suffers from VR motion sickness. So they've got the volunteers in the lab, they start them with the most extreme, 
and then have them gradually dial the experience downwards, have a period of adjustment once they get there, and then slowly dial back up to see where that sweet spot is. Their hope is that eventually this is gonna find its way into game development SDKs or gaming engines, and it becomes almost as natural as tweaking a setting in-game. It literally becomes part of the structure of the game. I don't know how that is gonna be implemented mass scale, but that's up for uh, programmers way more talented than me to try to figure out. Well guys, that is it for the Saturday edition of VR News. Like I said yesterday, hope you guys are having a kick arse weekend. As always, cheers.